Okay, today we are going to explain saws. All of them. Unfortunately, when it comes to the topic of saws, as with most anything with hand tools, there are going to be arguments. I'm going to say things today that you're going to say, no, that's wrong. And it's just depending upon which way you're looking at it, what tradition you come from and how you want to do things. That being said, big caveat, let's dive in and actually talk about what are the different types of saws and where would they be used. In the broadest of terms, in the most general way, there are three types of saws. There are panel saws. It's just a simple plate. There are back saws. Look, they have a back on them. And there are frame saws. Hey, check it out. This thing's got a frame. It's pretty self-explanatory. Panel saws, back saws, frame saws, all saws, theoretically, technically, should fit into one of those three categories. Yes, even the Japanese have panel saws and back saws and frame saws as well. Now, they're going to call them different things, but with every tradition and every language, you're going to have different names for it. In general, though, all the saws can be categorized by those three types. Those three categories, though, have very little to do with what does the saw actually do, because there are some panel saws that are smaller than some back saws. And there are frame saws of all shapes and sizes. That classification is more or less, you know, what does it look like? I'm gonna to start today with the most used saw in my shop. The dovetail saw? No. The panel saw? No. The frame saw? No. It's the sash saw. The sash saw is a medium sized back saw. It comes from the Western tradition and it has cross cut teeth. This is what you would use for a lot of your joinery work and it's deep enough you can do a lot of things with it. It also has a long enough stroke so you can move quickly. If we go up one size, then we are at the tenon saw. Traditionally, this has a rip cut tooth. It's a very similar size to the sash, although often it is considerably larger. It's a little deeper because you need to cut down the cheeks of your tenons, so it needs to cut a little deeper. One step down from the sash saw is the carcass saw. It's also a back saw. This one has cross cut teeth, and it is a joinery saw just like the sash saw, but it's a little smaller, which gives you a little more control. And then we step down one more step, and we're at the dovetail saw. <gasps> oh, you can just hear the angels singing. A dovetail saw, yes. Rip cut teeth, back plate, really thin cut, very little set, very detailed saw. Not a fast saw, but a very detailed saw. Those are the four most common Western saws, and they're all basically for joinery. You've cut the board to length and width and general dimension. Now you're doing all the joinery. You're doing the pieces, the dovetails, the tenons, and actually cutting it out. And these are the saws you're going to be using most of the time. There's always a good bit of work ahead of time breaking the stock down and shaping it up, but most of your time is going to be spent on the joinery. Now, I know a lot of you want me to go into the Japanese saws. I'm going to hold that off for a little bit because uh, there's some interesting stuff there. The panel saws, in general, are bigger than the back saws. There's also no back on them, so the plate tends to be a little bit thicker so that they uh, don't bend under the weight. There is a weird class that goes in between these two that's called a halfback. I don't have one, but it looks like a smaller panel saw. It's usually only about that long, about the length of a tendon saw, and the back only goes about halfway down. It's kind of surprising why they would pick the name halfback, but they're very rare and they're kind of like the jack of all trades, which means that they're really not great at any one thing, but they can do them all. The nice thing about a panel saw is that there's nothing stopping for how deep you can cut. And that sounds like a great thing, but the only time you need to do that is when you're cutting really big stock or ripping something down. For all your joinery work, there's, there's no reason to go much deeper than that. Now this is officially a panel saw, and that's usually any length saw up to about 26 inches that doesn't have a back on it. If you go larger than that, then you've got one of these saws, and this is called a hand saw. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, hand saw, aren't they all hand? No, this is a hand saw. The rest of them are other saws. But yeah, that's the name of this saw. This is the hand saw. So just like this is a sash saw, this is a panel saw, this is a hand saw which is usually only saw that's at least 26 inches or longer. Most of the time, they're up around 30 inches plus. And most of the time, these have really big rip teeth. These are the saws that you use to rip the board down lengthwise. This is probably the second most used saw in my shop. I do most of my joinery work with the sash saw, but this is what I use for breaking down stock. Now, most panel saws fall into these two, but there are some other weird ones, like this. This is a floor saw. It has a curved blade on it, so you can actually start in the middle of the floor and you can work your way in and cut on the middle of a surface without starting at the outside edge. Along that same line, 
there's one of these. And these ones are kind of interesting because the screws on them can loosen up and then this blade can extend in and out for however long you want it to be. This is called a keyhole saw because it can actually get into a keyhole. So you would drill a hole in the middle of the board and then you could use this to cut it out. If you need to go something thicker, you can pull it out. But if you don't need it so thick, you can move it back in and you have a little more strength in your cut. Now let's move on to the, the, the frame saws. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, this is, this is a Robo style frame saw. And this is actually a small one. This one's only 36 inches and most of the time they're 48 or longer. You could get versions of this would actually do pit saw work. In other words, taking a log and turning it into lumber. This has really big rip teeth. Really big rip teeth are phenomenal for resawing or turning a log into lumber. If you need to cut something really wide and rip it down, this is the one you grab. In function, it handles a lot like the handsaw. Most of the time, I'm just gonna grab the handsaw, but if I'm cutting through something really thick and I'll be spending a while doing it, the nice thing about this is I can get my entire body on it. I can put both hands on this and go to town on the saw. That allows me to put my weight of my body into it and it's less tiring and I can do it longer with this. This is also a frame saw, but this is a type of frame saw called a bow saw. It has a string on the back that holds the whole thing in tension. Just like the string of a bow is pulling the arms in, this is pulling the arms in as well. Now this particular one is a continental style joinery saw. So when England moved to the back saws, most of continental Europe stuck with these frame saws. This is basically a tenon saw. It has rip cut teeth and it's designed for larger cuts. You can actually support the weight of it with these handles back here. It feels rather ergonomic. And then these handles can turn so the blade can rotate. So if you want to, you can balance the saw on top of the blade and cut straight down. Or if you rotate the handles just a little bit and can't the handle off like this, then you can cut continuously as far down as you want to go. Still to this day, you're going to find way more of these in continental Europe than you're going to find in back saws. But because most of the woodworking tradition in America came from England, back saws tend to be far more popular in America as well. Next, I've got this one. This is a buck saw. This would be used for bucking logs or cutting logs down into smaller pieces. Bucking it, slicing it into about 18 inch long slices before you cut them into firewood. It is a type of bow saw. It is a type of frame saw. So a bow saw is a type of frame saw, but not all frame saws are bow saws. This one though has this turnbuckle on top rather than a rope. It's actually a solid piece of wire that is pulled tight. Now a note about all frame saws. When you're done with the cutting for the day, you want to take the tension off. You don't want to keep them under tension because they'll slowly wear out over time the longer they're left in tension. So you want to leave it until it's kind of blah, 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 and kind of flopsy. Then we've got this little bugger. This is a turning saw. It is a frame saw, it is a bow saw, and it's a turning saw. This allows you to make curves and turn things. It's called a turning saw because you can cut and curve and turn anything you mount. It's usually about 12 inches plus in length so that you can go through slightly thicker stock. The handles also turn on this like they do on most bow saws so that you can actually keep going through the work and then turn the handles and change your orientation of the saw to the board. These are a lot of fun to work with, but they're a little slower, so you gotta have some patience. Moving along that line, then we can go up to the fret saw or the coping saw. And these come in a bunch of different shapes. Now, what's the difference between a fret saw and a coping saw? Generally, it's what you call it. A lot of fret saws would be called a coping saw. Though some people will say that a fret saw has a much smaller, finer blade than a coping saw, whereas a coping saw has a little bit larger blade. You will also see sometimes jeweler's saws where this arm can move in and out so you can get a smaller blade in there or a bigger blade. Some of them have long throats so you can reach way into the middle of a board and do your cutting. I don't use these that often. I generally prefer to use the turning saw. I find this to be far more comfortable, faster, and just all around simpler. So that's why I actually don't even have blades for these ones because I haven't used them in forever. Now those are the majority ones you're gonna come across quite regularly. And those are the ones that easily fit into different categories. But what about things like this? This is a veneer saw. And it's actually a really cool tool that's perfectly flush on this side so I can cut up against a fence and slice down veneer. It's got an incredibly, it's got an incredibly thin blade and you can see how the teeth all point to the middle. These ones point this way and these ones point this way. And that way as you're cutting, you're pulling with the teeth on this side or you're pushing with the teeth on that side depending upon what edge is down is how you're doing it. And sometimes you want a lighter cut and so you can actually push against the rake on the saw. It's a really interesting and rare tool but if you work with veneers a lot, this is invaluable. This saw is banned by the Geneva Convention and it's called a gent saw. 
Okay, it, it's not really banned, but I absolutely hate these things. They're, they're kind of like the worst of all orders, but some people really like them. It is a back saw because there's a back on there. It's got a straight handle, which just makes it feel weird. Now, if you work with a really low bench, this is nice, but if you're working with any bench of any particular height, uh, this handle is just annoying. Because the handle is straight out, my hand wants to go down farther to do the cutting, or I've got to tip it up and cut like this, and it's just not quite right there. Whereas putting the handle at an angle allows my arm to come up and I can cut at bench height rather than down here on the floor. But that being said, these are incredibly cheap because nobody wants them. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of people who do like having these for doing dovetail work and fine joinery. Uh, so, yeah, if you're a little mentally twisted, you might find you like a gent saw. Now, there are also stair saws and bone saws and fly saws, and, and the list goes on and on. There are a ton of different types of saws out there, and every one of them has its own little place where it fits in and does well. Like a veneer saw, you're not going to use this daily, but about once a year I pull out veneer, and this thing is invaluable. It is so nice and just works beautifully but it only does it for that one thing. Wait, you didn't talk about Japanese saws. Fine, I'll talk about Japanese saws. They look like these. There. Now, honestly, Japanese saws come in bow saws, frame saws, and back saws as well. The Dazuki is usually the dovetail saw. Very, very fine little teeth that get into things. It's got a back to keep it stiff. Yes, even with a Japanese saw that you pull, uh, it still needs some rigidity, and so that's why the really fine ones do have backs on them. Contrary to popular belief, this is not a flush cut saw. This saw has set in the teeth. In other words, the teeth stick out farther than the plate. So if I use it to flush cut, the set on the teeth will scratch up my work. Both traditions, Japanese as well as Western saws, had flush cut saws. There are saws that have no set and you can flex and bend them right up to whatever you're cutting on. And in technicality, they're a panel saw. The other cool thing about the Ryoba is that it actually has two sets of teeth, one on either side. One side is for rip cut, and one side is for cross cut. So you get two saws for one. And most of the time, they are disposable. So the blade you can replace and put another one in so you don't have to mess with sharpening, because the teeth on these can be sharpened, but with traditional Japanese saws, though, they are intended to be sharpenable, but most of them that you're going to buy at the big box store, or pretty much anywhere online, are intended to be disposable. A lot of beginners love Japanese saws because they just cut straight. You don't have to worry about them because they tend to, to track the way you want them to. The downside to them is if you set it up ever so slightly off, it's going to track perfectly straight right down that, and they are a pain to try and bring back into work. The reason for that is the leading tooth is on the other side of the work. As I'm cutting, the first tooth to enter the work is back over there. And that means that I have no control about that because I'm on this side of the board. With a western saw, the controlling tooth is on my side of the board. And that sounds like it's a great thing. But that means that any slight movement in your wrist, any amount of body movement, anything that's out of alignment, will say, oh yeah, I want to go that way, oh yeah, I want to go that way, and the saw goes all over the place. And that can make it very, very difficult for the beginner because a slight bit of overcorrection and the saw just flies over one way or the other. But if you get into it and you spend the time to learn the skill, now you have all the control if it's on your side. So if it does start to go off or it hits some grain or something pushes it one way or another, you can bring it back onto course because slight course corrections work really, really well with Western saws. With Japanese saws, it takes a little bit more. You've got to make sure you set it up right. And if you do set up right, it works phenomenally. And so that's why you generally find a lot of beginners or people who'd use them occasionally love Japanese saws. But most people who are all hand tools end up going towards Western saws. Ooh, I just triggered a whole bunch of people. This is going to be fun. So which saws should you get? A lot of people who get into woodworking think, oh yes, the dovetail saw, because everyone thinks about it. This is like the primo, the nice, the beautiful thing. But really, I, I, I don't use this that much. I use it when I'm cutting really small joinery, which happens from time to time. And if you're working with a lot of boxes, then this might be the tool for you. The single most used tool in my shop is the sash saw. If you are going to buy one western saw, I would suggest either a sash saw or a carcass saw. This is the saw you're going to use more than anything else for your joinery. And if you're really trying to up your game and do that detailed joinery, 
that's where you're going to want to be. A cross-cut saw with a functional amount of use, something that is really comfortable and shaped to your hand. If you're wanting to go all caveman, getting a big handsaw is really useful for breaking down stock. With this, you can rip the boards down to width, and this does it very, very quickly. It's probably the second most used tool in my shop. After that, everything is kind of specialty. If you find that you want to do a lot of tenons, then get a tenon saw. If you find that you want to do more detail, but you want to cut a little bit deeper, get a panel saw. If you find you want to get back into power tools and get away from hand tools a little bit more, well then go get a Japanese saw because these are great additions to the power tool shop. They don't require that constant skill and you can really get going with them. If you got a little extra space in your shop and you want to have some fun, then think about a frame saw or a bow saw. These things are really enjoyable. They take a very different skill set, but they can really provide some big cutting in a fast way. Now, I really ran through that, and I've got videos on almost every one of these saws individually. So if you want to see something specific, uh, they're, they're out there. But I, I also left out a lot of other saws that I could talk about. So if there's some favorite saw that I didn't talk about, then throw that down in the comments. I would love to read through that and see what I missed. Please throw comments down. It really helps us out. Thank you. It's one of those things that helps us get in front of more people, helps the channel grow, and really means a lot. So thank you for that. If you would like to help us out even more, though, other than the normal like, comment, share, subscribe, these names over here, those are people on Patreon. They are the ones who pay for this channel. We are completely sponsored by you. We're not sponsored by the saw companies. I get to say what I want to say. And it really means a lot to me that I get to actually make the statements I want to say rather than, hey... This company is sponsoring me and wanting me to show off their particular tools. I can grab the tool that I actually want to use and the tool that is really benefiting me in the shop. So thank you for that. If you'd like to find out more about that, you know what to do. Patreon, links down below, join. Thank you. <laughs> I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. I should get a bunch of people to figure this out. What would a bunch of people be called? Oh, a panel. I could get a bunch of people. I could get a panel together to help us turn back and, and, and see what we, we should have sawn.